think should be underway. Perfect. Okay. So welcome back for business ethics lecture number two. If you recall last week we looked at you know the function of, of ethics in an organization. We discussed some of the implications of what it means to be ethical and why ethics in business practice is becoming more and more um, pertinent. So that's not to say that you know businesses perhaps weren't considering ethics. It's just there was no onus on legalities around business ethics. Okay, increasingly governments, citizens, and the global um, the global environment itself has necessitated that we consider the impacts that businesses are having on the local environment, on the resources that they're using, but also on the ways in which um, they they source their products. Okay, so if you recall, we we looked at. A number of examples of where poor business ethics or where poor mal malpractice um, has uh, has come through and I don't know if you had a chance to look at Nestle case study but Nestle is an excellent example of an organization that has done well to turn itself around but it still has more to do in order to win back the trust of, 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 of the, the, the public and of its customers. So let's now build on where we were last time around. Today's lecture is going to be all about understanding what I call the role of corporate governance in, in business ethics. Okay, so we can sit here and talk about ethics until the cows come home, but no one is actually going to do anything unless there is a level of corporate governance in any given organization. Okay, so corporate, I'm sure, as you all know, means high level. You're talking about boardroom, you are talking about very senior management who have the power to make decisions that impact on the organization. Okay, so without good, strong corporate governance, any policies, any incentives, any initiatives run by an organization that may be morally correct will always fall away because there is no support at the highest level of the organization. So corporate governance is increasingly becoming important in the fight to maintain but also further boost business ethics procedures. So what are we going to do? Well today we're going to understand and identify what we mean by organisational stakeholders. We'll also do a little bit of stakeholder analysis and stakeholder mapping. Now again you might be thinking well what stakeholders got to do with it? Well think about it this way okay. Stakeholders are those people that push the business to do what's right. And as we mentioned, um, for those of you that might have attended my business environment lecture, um, stakeholders can be anyone and everyone that has an association with a business. So it doesn't have to be internal stakeholders like employees or managers or, or people within a business. It can also be the customers, it can be suppliers, it can be the government, it can be the local community. So lots of different stakeholders that have an interest in seeing the business do the right thing. So it's important that we understand what role and function they play in pushing an organization to do what's right on a business ethics front, okay? So what do I want to talk to you today about? Well, firstly, governance, and I've mentioned this a couple of times already, but what is governance? Well, <laughs> that's important in any organization because it's what holds the company together. It's what gives a company structure. It's what allows the organization to push on and become um, both a morally and ethically correct organization, okay? So governance is important because it holds the organization to account and makes sure that there are robust policies that are in place that ensure um, fairness and equity, both in what a business does, but also in how it does it too, okay? So we then move into what's called good governance. And you might be thinking, well, what's the difference then? You know, if governance is all about having good, having policies in place to ensure fair and just, well, good governance takes it slightly further in the sense that good governance is all about having policies and procedures in place that ensure accuracy, consistency, and responsiveness to key stakeholders that can include, you know, customers, shareholders, regulators, et cetera. So the big distinction is it's all about making sure that what the business is doing is not only fair and equal, but it's also consistent. So if it's being applied in one area, if it's being applied in one function, it should be applied throughout the business. If it was applied 
six months ago, then it should also be applied today. Yes, it might change, it might be better, but it should at least be as good as it was six months ago, okay? So consistency is also important. And finally, responsiveness. Now you might be thinking, well, what's responsiveness got to do with it? But if you think about it, what we see as being morally or ethically correct or wrong today is very, very different to how society saw things as being morally or ethically correct even as little as 10, 15, 20 years ago, okay? So I'll give you an example of that. Um, I'm sure you all are aware of the current topical issues, particularly around the Black Lives Matter movement and racial diversity um, around the globe, really, but predominantly in America is, is where the movement started. Um, if you recall, in, in the UK, there was also um, protests and demonstrations supporting the Black Lives Matter movement, and some people actually toppled statues statues that belong to um, trade, sorry, slave owners or people that are involved in the slave trade. Um, the point there being when those statues are put up, people thought it's a good thing, you know, let's celebrate these people. Because in the past, they were seen as famous slave owners, as tra a trade slave trade owners. But today, in hindsight, based on our knowledge, based on our awareness of diversity or awareness of people, we think, hold on a minute, those people were morally and ethically corrupt they were abusing people of a particular heritage and using them for for a lesser purpose so today and in, in, in today's world we see that as being a bad thing and, and that's correct it is a bad thing but if you go back you know 100 years or or even even three four hundred years a lot of what was happening then was seen as being correct so being responsive in an organizational sense is important because a business should adapt, it should understand that as society gets smarter, as society gets more informed, more aware of the issues facing different groups, facing different um, uh, organisations, facing different countries, then the business should also be doing what's, what, what, what was correct. So, for example, you might have seen recently the Palestine um, and, and Israel um, conflict. They've been, at, they've been going at war although things have calmed down recently, and um, they're still fighting against each other. A lot of businesses are boycotting Israel because they feel that Israel is perhaps not behaving in the right way or they're not treating the Palestine people fairly. So again, that's an example of governance, okay? That's businesses being responsive. They're understanding that their customers care about what's going on in the world, and they're trying to make sure that they're seen to do the right thing, okay? So that's what good governance says. It's about accuracy, consistency, and being responsive. And then that in turn can lead to what we're going to talk about today, which is all about ethical governance, okay? So ethics in this context being all about ensuring that what's being done is just, it's fair. It also reflects on what society in general feels to be accurate and correct, okay? So that's how, we, that's how the, the progression of thought, shall we say, for today's lecture um, will, 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 will be undertaken. So governance is important because governance is what drives business ethics and is what drives the correct behaviour. But the focus of today's lecture is specifically going to be on corporate governance, okay? And corporate governance covers all three stages, whether it's looking at governance on its own, whether it's looking at good governance, or whether it's looking specifically at ethical governance. Corporate governance is something that's encapsulates encapsulated in all three and the reason corporate is important is because this is where your decision makers are sitting okay these are the people that have the power to make decisions that will change what an organization does through and through corporate layer of an organization is where the power lies so what do we want to know about corporate governance well firstly what is corporate governance um, and apologies i seem to have put that um bubble right over the text, but I will just read it out to you what it says. So corporate governance is a system by which companies um, can direct, can be directed and controlled, okay? So corporate governance provides a way in which organizations are structured, it provides a way in which organizations can be directed, and at the end of the day to control what the business is doing. Corporate governance is also the aim Sorry, corporate governance. With corporate governance, the aim is to align as nearly as possible the interests of individuals, corporations, and society. And that's particularly important because 
Corporate governance isn't just there to serve the best interests of the business. It's also there to understand, well, what do our people want? What do individuals, both internal and external to our organisation, think is important? What is business's stance? You know, what do corporations believe to be correct? And finally, what does society at large believe to be correct? So it's really important that they recognise the combination of all three. It's about individuals within the business. It's about corporations such as competitors or people you might be working with, partners. And finally, society at large, what does society think is correct? And how does corporate governance work? Well, the triangle that we have here starts to provide some sort of direction. So if we start with management in the bottom left hand corner, the yellow line tells you the relationship between, between the three. So management, if we look across to the right, regularly reports and updates the board of directors. Okay, The board of directors are, are responsible for overseeing corporate governance. The board of directors are elected and dismissed by the shareholders. Okay, So the board of directors, they're accountable directly to shareholders. And the shareholders are also those that provide the capital that goes to management to spend in the organization. How do they provide the capital? By buying shares, okay? So if you think about it, shareholders are the ones that hold the most power and there's two people that's accountable to them. The board of directors and indirectly the management team too, but the management team do that by reporting and updating the board of directors, okay? So that's the relational link. But what's important here in terms of governance is thinking about how that relationship is enacted. Again, you can see here that management are the ones that provide transparent reporting to shareholders. So they're the ones that are responsible for coming up with all the figures, all the information that goes into the annual report. The board of directors are the ones that represent and report to the shareholders, okay? They're the face of the organization. They're the ones that you know, do the conferences, they're the ones that turn up at uh, um, senior level meetings, they're the ones that, you know, inevitably are the ones that are seen as being responsible for the organisation. But in order to do that, there's a lot of guidance and supervision that the board of directors must provide to management, okay? So these are the three key functions that have to collaborate, corroborate, to ensure that corporate governance is delivered. So how else can we understand it? Well, basically, it's a system of principles, policies, procedures, and clearly defined responsibilities used by stakeholders to overcome the conflicts of interest inherent in the corporate forum. So what do I mean by that? Well, basically, corporate governance is almost like a system. It gives you the principles, the policies, the procedures, all of which are clearly defined. It also shows you who's accountable to who. And these are the systems that will be used by stakeholders in order to overcome any potential conflict, okay? Conflicts can happen. At the end of the day, boards are made of people, both corporate governance and management. These are people. Sometimes they will disagree. Sometimes they will collide. What will they rely on to then make a decision? Well, the corporate governance framework, okay? That's what they will use to overcome any potential occasion where there's a clash of ideas or a clash of thought. So the corporate forum um, of governance is what always must be adhered to in, a, in situations when people can reach an agreement. Essentially, it involves balancing the interests of a company's many stakeholders, such as the shareholders, the management, the customers, suppliers, financiers, that can be banks, that can be private corporations that have lent you money, um, the government and the local community, okay? Again, I did have a short YouTube video. The um, only thing is, I'm not sure it will work. I might have to stop the share and share again. But I think it's quite useful for you to watch the video to understand governance um, based on the, the Australian example. So bear with me two seconds. I'm just going to stop sharing. And I am going to just start the video and then I will restart the, sh the sharing as well. Give me two seconds.
What is corporate governance? Well, it's not rocket surgery. It's what you can do to keep your organisation off the front page of the newspaper. There are various definitions. According to the ASX Corporate Governance Council, Corporate governance is the system of rules, relationships and practices that determine the direction and control of an organisation. And according to OECD, Corporate governance is a key element in improving economic efficiency and growth as well as enhancing investor confidence. But in practical terms, governance means the system by which an organisation is controlled and operates and the mechanisms by which it and its people are held to account. The word governance comes from Latin, meaning helmsman or captain of the ship. The board is principally responsible for ensuring the corporate bodies discharge their responsibilities to stakeholders. It defines the relationships between directors, management, shareholders and the stakeholders. Authority cascades down from the board to the CEO and the executive management team and throughout the organisation. For a good governance practice, there are four essential elements. Transparency, accountability, stewardship and integrity. There is no single model of corporate governance and no one-size-fits-all approach. Good corporate governance is about working out the practices to make and carry out corporate decisions and also monitor the decisions and the organization's performance. It is not just about ticking a series of boxes to meet the regulatory requirements or getting tied up in red tape or bureaucracy. Professionals involved in this important area need to keep up to date with changes in legislation and regulation, market practice and expectations. Governance Institute of Australia is the only independent professional association with sole focus on whole of organisation governance, helping to generate a best practice culture and... Okay, I'm just going to stop there. It's not an advertisement for um, Corporate Governance Australia, but the principles of corporate governance are, are, are clear, okay, in terms of what they are all about and, and why they exist. So let's go back to our slide deck so that we can continue what we were discussing. So, as I said already, it involves more than just balancing the interest of a company um, and its stakeholders. It's also about considering how can an organisation best carry out, best deliver, best conduct what is correct for both stakeholders, but also the interests of the business. Okay. However, as we all know, and I'm sure you can all think of examples either from your own home countries or from recent news stories you might have heard, things can go very, very wrong um, when it comes to managing an organisation and doing what is ethically correct. So here are some examples of things that have happened in organisations that have happened in certain countries that um, have made recent news headlines. So bribery, where people are paying one another to get decisions in their favour. Coercion, where perhaps someone has got some dirt on someone else and they're using that to their advantage. Insider trading, that's where perhaps people have got insider information and they're using that to buy and sell shares at a favourable price. Again, that's morally incorrect and ethically wrong. Conflicts of interest, so again, perhaps there's issues with, you know, if you're a shareholder and you're also someone in charge of making decisions, maybe you want certain decisions to be made over others because they make more sense to you. However, that's you perhaps not looking out for the best interests of the business. That's you looking out for your own best interests. So that's an example of a conflict. Unfair discrimination, now that can happen for a host of different reasons. Um, diversity policies came about because of a lot of the, the, the policies around unfair discrimination of different groups, whether it be based on race, on age, on gender, um, on sexual preference, all of these things um, are examples of areas where people have been discriminated against both in the workplace and in society at large. Political donations and gifts, so again, that's a difficult one because in some countries, governments are also involved in the bribery part. So if you pay the government well or you feed the government, then they're likely to rule in your favour. False presentations and statements. Again, fabricated documentation or fabricated evidence that doesn't actually exist, but has been made up to serve a particular purpose. I guess one of the most recent examples of that was Martin Bashir, employed by the BBC to try and get an interview with Princess Diana. He made up um, a false document and he actually shared that with the princess or late princess and her brother. Um, so again, example of false representation. 
And finally, accumulation of profits by illegal means. So again, some organizations are reverting to practices that are not approved by government, that are not approved by the countries in which they operate, and they're operating businesses that are some in some cases illegal and therefore um, generating revenue that is not seen or what you could call black revenue in the sense that it's money made that there's no traceability for, okay? So you usually end up seeing issues of money laundering appear as a result of that type of behavior. So these are a few examples I've given you. I don't know if you've maybe come across any more, so I'll open the floor. Feel free to either come off mute and share your thoughts or if you type into a chat box, any other examples of bad corporate governance or bad decisions or bad things happening in a company or even in a country that you're aware of. If you could share that with me, um, either through a chat function or by speaking out loud, that would be great. I'll give you a minute or two to, to, to gather your thoughts. of examples and I'm sure this one you're all aware of so Apple I'm sure everyone has at some point in their life heard or seen or even perhaps owned an Apple device you know iPads iPhones iPods or iMac even so you might have built used, or even have currently an Apple device so you may have you may recall sorry way back in 2010 over 10 years ago now there's a global scandal um based on the Foxconn situation. So Apple were using a Chinese company, uh, Foxconn, to produce their mobile phone handsets. And um, you know, that's where they got the production facility. And the and some of the headlines that were ran were, you know, Silicon Valley sweatshops. So, you know, they were using these facilities where workers were sometimes working long shifts. I'm talking 15, 16, 17 hour shifts um, to produce mobile phones for Apple. And as a result, they were actually producing them at a wage that was below what you would call a living wage, okay? So as a result of the global scandal from Apple's situation, it led to a doubling of basic wage in China. So the basic wage of employees in China actually doubled because of the findings from the Foxconn scandal. Obviously, Apple is the world's largest um, mobile phone manufacturer and China is the world's largest electronics manufacturer. Okay, there's one million workers in China working in that sector. Now, what was the problem? Well, in Foxconn, there's a very, very stressful environment for migrant workers. So what you tended to find was a lot of the workers weren't actually Chinese by heritage. They were mostly people that had come to China in search of work. So migrants from Vietnam, migrants from neighboring countries, that had come into China to try and get work because China was a booming economy. Now, unfortunately, because of the conditions that these workers were subjected to, some of them actually ended up committing suicide. I think the suicide rate in that company was 3,000% higher than the average company in China. So that just goes to show how bad the situation must have been. So for every one death in another Chinese company, there was 30 in Foxconn. 3,000% um, higher than any other company. So what was Foxconn's reaction? Well, firstly, they started by increasing salaries by one third. So each employee got 33% more. They then employed trained counselors. They bought in people that were actually responsible for, you know, if someone was having suicidal thoughts or someone was struggling mentally or physically, they could go and speak to a counselor. And they also installed more leisure facilities so people could take a break. They could forget about their day job. They could actually try and relax during their breaks. Um, and again, I've got an example of a YouTube video that um, you may want to watch. So what I'll do is I'll post that in the chat and you may well want to kind of revisit that to understand the Foxconn situation. But essentially, Foxconn was the Chinese supplier for Apple mobile phones and the working conditions were so bad that they had the highest level of suicide rates of any other Chinese company at the time. Okay, so a company as large as Apple who's charging hundreds, if not thousands of pounds for their devices um, showed an example of poor corporate governance. The fact that Foxconn were traced back to Apple was a major, major um, slap in the face for Apple. Um, it impacted the share price 
and it also gave them very, very negative publicity around their worker rights. So that's the Foxconn example. But what do we mean by corporate governance further? So one of the ways we can understand it is around the scope of the corporate governance. There's two views that we can take. Now, the narrow view is very much all about the enhancement of shareholder value and protecting shareholder interests. So we were talking earlier about, you know, how corporate governance is, um, you know, it's all about looking good on paper, but at the end of the day, it's all about profit management. It's all about making sure shareholders are happy. Well, that's what we call a narrow view on corporate governance, okay? So here we talk about the focus being on the structure and functioning of board of directors, the rights of shareholders in the boardroom, and the decision-making director remuneration. So again, what we're saying here, we're talking about making sure directors are well paid, we're talking about making sure shareholders and profits, dividends, realize good value for their shareholding. And finally, making sure that decision-making directors get a comfortable pack pay package, you know, bonuses um, from generating profits. Problem there is, it can sometimes lead to a separation of ownership and control so what do you mean by that? Well, something called fiduciary or fiduciary, sorry, um, relationship. And what that means is at the end of the day, if you're employed by an organization, your, your primary concern should be to look out for the best interests of that organization. However, if you're a large senior director, if you're a CEO, and you know that if you make a large profit this year, your bonus is going to be an extra 50% on top of your salary. Are you really going to think about the long-term health of the business or are you going to try and generate as much profit as you can, get your bonus and then potentially leave in a couple of years? So that creates a conflict sometimes, okay? And we call that the fiduciary relationship whereby employees also have to self-serve themselves. As human beings, we all do it. Psychologically, we can't detach ourselves. No matter how good we think we are as as good corporate citizens, we always will try and look after ourselves and that's just human behavior. Unfortunately, that can lead to issues in the boardroom or lead to issues at lot senior positions in an organization because as you can imagine, these people that are responsible for making the, the decisions in a company, yes, they are held accountable and yes, they know that if they take the wrong decision, they could face consequences, but at the end of the day, they're also, as was mentioned on the call earlier, responsible for delivering profit. And if they sometimes do deliver on profit, they can get rewarded, even if other areas of the business are struggling. So again, what you sometimes see in times of economic hardship, when companies are trying to reward their, their senior managers with bonuses, is usually a massive uproar. A lot of the large banks, for example, stopped rewarding their CEOs or their senior directors any bonus in 2008, 2009 because of a global financial crisis. They thought it wasn't correct, both morally and ethically, to be rewarding senior executives when people were losing their jobs, losing their homes, and struggling to, 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 to survive. Okay, so that's a narrow view of corporate governance. But the broader view, and this tends to be more rigorously followed in perhaps the Western or developed world is all about the set of relationships between a company, its management, the board of directors, the shareholders, and other stakeholders. Okay, so this is a community, this is including its customers, this is including um, governments, etc. Oh. Et so this encompasses the yeah. concept of as being a caring entity. Well, that's awesome. Okay. So well, that's awesome. Sorry if could someone just go into me mm -hmm. about the tobacco industry and how originally um, tobacco industry denied that, you know, tobacco can cause ill health effects, whereas by the end of the process, they, they accepted that, yes, tobacco does cause health problems and they have a responsibility to try and warn people not to smoke. So I don't know if anyone on the call is a smoker. However, I believe packaging in which cigarettes are now sold has pictures of lung damage. It has pictures of the, 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 the health implications of smoking. So the idea of doing that is to perhaps deter people from wanting to smoke, okay? So again, that's an example of corporate governance in action. It's about organizations doing something 
that meets the need of society. It, it's about making sure that citizens are, the citizens' needs, sorry, are being looked after. Okay, it's up to you if you want to buy the cigarette, but at least they've done what they can to warn you that there are serious side effects of you consuming tobacco. So that's a broader view on corporate governance, okay? So narrow view, all about shareholders, all about directors, all about profit. Broader view takes into consideration other stakeholders as well. And by that, we mean people like the government, we mean local community, we mean customers, suppliers, workers, etc., etc. Okay. So we saw some of this already in the video that you watched. Um, the only difference being fairness and integrity are very much one and one or the other. Okay, they mean the same thing, um, just two slightly different words. So what are the four pillars that we need to be aware of? Well, firstly, accountability. Management needs to be held accountable. Okay, and management is held accountable to the board. The board of directors will be looking for management to deliver on the policies, the procedures, the, the strategies that, they, they, that they've set. And that will be done through performance me measurement, sorry, so KPIs, making sure that the organisation is doing what it should be doing. It also ensures that the board is accountable to share owners or shareholders, okay? So again, the board of directors don't just take that information and that's it. They, they then have to report that information back to shareholders and shareholders will want to see what the business has done over the last 12 months, how have they performed, why have they not realised the same benefits, why has the organisation perhaps struggled, or at the opposite, if the organisation has done well, to reward the, 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 the board of directors and to reward the organization for performing well, okay? So accountability is important in governance. We then have what's called fairness or integrity, and that's all about protecting people's rights, including shareholders, okay? So you would expect that the board of directors and the management will act with integrity, they'll be fair. You know, shareholders have put money into the business on the premise that people running the business are doing it with the business's best interests at heart. So it's all about integrity and doing the right thing. It's about treating all shareholders, including minorities, equitably. Whether or not you have one share or 100 million shares, you should be given a fair chance to, to, to contribute or to have, have your voice heard. So you'll, you, you've probably heard of what's called AGMs, annual general meetings. People that hold shares in a company by default should be invited to AGMs. Now, that doesn't always happen if you've bought your shares through a third party broker, okay? So nowadays, buying shares is easier than ever before. A lot of that is because of third party brokers, um, platforms, online platforms where you can buy and sell shares easily. Unfortunately, when you do that, you don't have quite have the same rights as if you were to buy the shares through a stock broker. When you buy them through a stockbroker, you actually have a direct link to the organization that you bought shares in. When you buy them from an online platform, you don't quite have that same level of um, insight because as far as the, the organization is concerned, it's actually the third party platform that's, that's dealing with the shares. It's not specifically you. But it's long story short, shareholders have the option and the ability to participate in decision making by attending the annual general meeting. We also have an element of transparency. So transparency is all about ensuring timely and accurate disclosure of all material matters. And what do you mean by that? Stuff like um, corporate annual reports, making sure that financial information is being reported firstly on time, but secondly, accurately, okay? There's been examples of organizations that have perhaps what we would call and can fuddle the numbers or perhaps inflate your numbers to make them look more attractive. The biggest example perhaps being Tesco, um, who recently, well, I say recently, almost 10 years ago now, um, were found to be guilty of inflating their numbers. So they got fined by the ombudsman as did their um, auditor, which I believe was Deloitte or PwC. And they were also fined for not picking up on those irregularities in Tesco's public accounts. 
And then finally, responsibility. Responsibility is all about recognizing the rights of stakeholders. It's about encouraging the organization between the company and the stakeholder to create wealth, jobs, and economic sustainability. So an organization's purpose, yes, is to make a profit, but in doing so, it's to create wealth for its people. It's to create opportunity for people to get pay rises. It's about creating jobs for people. And it's about delivering economic sustainability such that the business is turning over a profit, it's paying taxes, it's paying its workers, it's keeping the economy moving, okay? So economic sustainability is also important. So let's come back to what we were saying and what we meant by good governance. So with good governance, we're looking at taking that a little bit further. So those four pillars are just for governance. This takes it a little bit further by saying, well, what is good governance then? So we still have accountability. We also have transparency, responsiveness. We have equitable and inclusivity. So again, it's about making sure that everyone's voices are heard. It's about making sure that you have a robust diversity policy, but making sure that you're treating people equally regardless of their race, their gender, their age, their background, their um, sexual preference. You know, it's about making sure that people are treated as equal. It's about being effective and efficient at what you do. It's about following the rules of the law. So again, making sure that what the business does adheres to the regulations, it adheres to both national and international law. It's about creating a participatory framework. So what do you mean by participatory framework? Well, who's to say that what I create, I say I was to be a corporate governor, who is to say that if I created a framework that that framework would be accurate or that framework would be um, robust and fair? So by being participatory, it allows other people to hold the organisation to account. It allows other people to be involved in creating that corporate governance framework. And finally, consensus, consensus orientation. What that means is making sure that it's not just one voice, it's about the collective voice. It's about making sure that you go with the majority. So again, not just the CEO's voice. Yes, the CEO may have the final decision, but he or she will want to make sure that they consult other people. And when they consult other senior managers, they consult other directors, they consult other decision makers so that the decision that's made doesn't always fall on their shoulder. It's almost a way of sharing the blame if things go wrong. So these are examples of good governance that goes beyond standard governance. Right, I've been talking for a very, very long time. So I'm going to give you all a five minute break. Um, I make it currently um, on my clock, 10 to, three, 10 to four, sorry, UK time. So if we could all be back for 15.55 UK time, so that's five to four, um, five minute break, and we will resume with the rest of today's session, okay? Quick five minute break, thank you very much. Morally incorrect, you know, how China controls certain elements of society, but there'll be other people that that I'm sure will agree with what China are doing. So it's about ensuring equity, okay? It's about ensuring that um, everyone has a say, everyone has a right to be able to, to, to question. And unfortunately, I don't think that's quite the case in China today. Anyways, let's move on. So what we're doing um, in the latter half of today's lecture, well, let's now touch on the ethical component, okay? So we've looked at governance, we've looked at good governance, we're now going to look at ethical governance. So from what we know so far already, based on our lecture today and last week, a business can be said to be ethical only if it tries to reach a trade-off between pursuing economic objectives and social objectives. So that is to say that a business isn't just there to make a profit, it's also there to serve societal needs, okay? So perhaps that's a fair definition based on our discussions over the last two weeks, you know, being ethical is not just about making profit, 
It's also about considering the needs of society. Good business ethics is about developing trust and maintaining it so that organisations can flourish and maintain a good reputation. So again, not just being ethical, but demonstrating good business ethics where business is responsive. It um, considers what citizens' needs are. It isn't reactive, it's actually proactive and it pushes itself to make sure that it's constantly keeping itself in the loop on what its people want and what its citizens want and what its customers want. Okay, so that's good business ethics, all about developing trust and maintaining it so that the organization can flourish and maintain a good reputation. So ethical governance and how can we understand it? Well, there's certain elements of what we call good ethical practice Firstly, we have what's called the ethical code of conduct. So what that does is that outlines the behaviours that we would expect a business to demonstrate. Okay, So the code of conduct, that's how a business carries itself. That's how a business's employees engage with customers. That's how a business's managers behave in the organisation. It's how the business itself wants to be perceived by the outside world. So having an ethical code of conduct is the first step. It's about having an ethics committee. Now, an ethics committee is made up usually of both internal and external stakeholders. So you might have people from management, you would have people from the shop floor, your workers, you would have a director, most likely. You would also have perhaps local community. You would bring in people from outside of your business who would work as part of work. the ethics committee, make sure that your business is doing the right thing. It's about being transparent in the working. Now that's becoming more and more common. You probably heard of concepts such as open innovation, more recently open strategy. Those of you that are into your finance, you might have heard of open banking. It's all about making sure that companies are being transparent in what they're doing. It's about making sure that companies share information between one another. It's about making sure that companies make it clear how they're handling your information. Okay, so that's transparency in what the company does. Penalties, again, good corporate or good ethical governance should incorporate penalties. What should happen if a business doesn't abide or if a business doesn't do what it said it will do? What's the punishment, either financial, which is usually the case, or sometimes even resulting in um, senior managers or senior directors being fired for not demonstrating the correct behaviours? Fraud and corruption register. That's about making sure that you actually keep a note of where people have done something wrong. Now that's not to punish them always. That can also be to learn from mistakes, okay? So sometimes, I'm not saying this is always the case, sometimes people can accidentally do the wrong thing. They might not see it as being fraud, they might not see it as being corruption, but if you record that, you keep a register of it, it's something that people are then able to revisit and it stops you from making the same mistake over again. A contract procedure rules. So again, we talked about earlier um, how perhaps in certain countries, including the UK, we've seen former prime ministers or former politicians lobbying the government to try and win contracts for their businesses or trying to win contracts for businesses that they, that they are associated with. Well, that wouldn't happen if there's a robust contract procedure rule in place. And that means everyone that wants to win the contract, everyone that can provide the service and wants to tender for that service has the right to do that, okay? No one's bid is taken to be more preferential than the others. Each bid is assessed on the merits of its content, not the merits of stakeholders, not the merits of senior people who have relationships with other senior people. Anti-fraud and corruption policies. Again, that's a little, little bit of a given, fairly sensible to have anti-fraud and corruption policy. And finally, a risk assessment. So what do we mean by that? Well, that's proactively managing what risks your business faces. Now, again, sometimes risks can't be mitigated, okay? There are certain risks that a business must accept that will be there. But the question is, how does the business reduce the impact? How does the business reduce the likelihood of that risk becoming a problem. And that is all about risk assessment, okay? It's about creating a risk register. It's about actively managing 
and updating that risk register to make sure that the business is doing everything it can to minimize and to limit the impact of that risk on the business itself. Now, the last sentence there just talks about social systems. So in any social system, if defectors are not punished, it leads to further contamination and more defectors. And what I mean by that is, if for example, on the call today is 12 of us, if I was to demonstrate examples of unethical behavior, if I was to do something that isn't seen as being ethically correct, and I wasn't held account accountable, no one pulled me up or no one stopped me, then I'm sure someone else in the call will think, well, hold on a minute. If you can do it and get away with it, then why can't I? So it creates a culture of defectors, okay? So good corporate governance or the system of corporate governance should ensure that mistakes, issues are picked up there and then and people making them are held accountable for their actions. And it's just been a message or a chat come through. Let me just read that. Um, someone has an example here. Um, okay, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, contract fraud of someone in China. Okay, absolutely. So China's not the only country. Unfortunately, it happens in other countries too. Um, but I'm sure either directly or indirectly, everybody on the call has some experience or some knowledge of where there has been, you know, contract fraud, bribery, corruption, either in the news or in their personal circles or networks that they're aware of. So absolutely, thank you for again, sharing that example with us. Um, yep, absolutely. And these are the things that should be mitigated or controlled better through a more structured ethical governance framework, okay? I've got a few examples here. So Johari Meal, so, Ethical Fashion and Johari. Now, Johari are a company that care about where sustainable fashion comes from, okay? It's all about making sure that fashion isn't just about a label, isn't about the Zara or the Louis Vuitton or the um, Burberry or the, um, you know, the brands that, that people buy. Fashion is about the people that are working in those factories, the garment factories, about people that are collecting the cotton that is used to make the clothes that we wear. It's about ensuring that they also have certain rights. They also have certain conditions, okay? Um, so the mission and philosophy of Johari as an organization is to eliminate what they call long-term poverty in some of the world's most vulnerable children and young adults by building a system of societal enterprise and development programs. So they're specifically targeting younger people. Why are they doing that? Because unfortunately, in some countries around the world, child labor is a major issue. Um, companies will employ children. Children will work because they want to contribute to the household because their parents perhaps can't do it themselves. Some of them will have lost a parent or lost you know, a relative that was caring for them and therefore they now have the responsibility of taking care of their younger siblings or taking care of the rest of the family. So Juhari as an organization want to try and create a system or try to create a better working condition for them by giving them the skills, giving them the knowledge to become entrepreneurs, to be able to understand that they are part of the business cycle. They're not just there to produce the cotton, they're there to contribute to the fashion industry and how can they be educated so that they know their role Okay. And what's the challenge? Well, the challenge for them is how to provide long-term employment opportunities for young adults. And in particular, they're looking at the Kaibera slum, um, which I believe is in Kenya, um, and those people that lack academic skills. So again, as I said, they're usually young adults or children, um, people that perhaps didn't get a chance to go to school or complete their studies, and therefore have limited um, academic knowledge or skills. It's about giving them the opportunity to build those skills, but giving them the opportunity to demonstrate that they're also capable of delivering above and beyond what they're currently um, set up as, okay? 
And the solution, well, for them, it's about setting up a social enterprise garment factory in Nairobi, providing training and employment opportunities for young adults. I'll give you some examples of how they've done that on the next slide. There's been a couple of messages in the chat. I'm just going to, to, to read through them. So somebody's given an example of South Africa as well and how ministers control tenders, allocate tender allocation. Yep, so unfortunately it happens in a lot of countries. As I said, the UK is also an example of that and the David Cameron situation that happened not too long ago gives, you know, gives you an example that even in Western countries that call themselves democratic and fair, there's an example <laughs> of contract fraud and there's an example of, of tenders not being managed correctly, okay? Unfortunately, it's a sad reality um, of, of of, of human life. It's just about how does the country learn from it? How does the country start to hold these senior politicians accountable? Um, and again, someone's making the point that in China, it's not even guaranteed that you get the tender. Absolutely. So these are all excellent points and these all link into what we're thinking about here, okay? So in your assignment, I don't want you to directly talk about a country or a government, but I want you to think about these elements. I want you to think about, you know, what is the impact of this on businesses? So if you're a business operating in China or South Africa, what does that mean to you? How do you, how would you get around the system? Would you have to also, you know, take part in unethical behavior? How do you do business in these countries? Um, so these are all things to consider, okay? Right, coming back to our example of Johari. So here is a couple of pictures, okay? So the Kibera slum in Kenya, this is what it used to look like before Johari were involved. So you've got a business center in the top left picture and it looks very run down. It looks very, very basic. Um, it doesn't look as if they've got the necessary facilities to run a business center. You know, you've got a child standing in front of a locked door. You've got, you know, very much slum-like conditions. You know, these buildings don't look very secure. These buildings don't look very, very um, stable or safe, perhaps in, 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 in um, difficult weather conditions. And then that is the same facility, the same business center on the right-hand side. Um, this is after Johari got involved. Johari transformed it into a garment center. So these ladies, as you can see, are working on the machines. They are creating clothing, um, fashionable items that will probably be sold in the UK and other European or Western world markets. But if you look here, they've now got the necessary environment. They've got the facilities, they've got the equipment, um, and they've got the, the conditions, okay? They've got a real building with lights, with sanitation, with, with seating and proper uh, equipment for them to do their job. So this is what I mean by ethical fashion. So this is an example of corporate governance being enacted by an organization, Johari. Um, now Johari don't actually do their own fashion. They just act as a third party trying to make sure that the people involved in the supply chain of fashion the people that, as I said, source the cotton, the people that make the products in developing countries are also given equal rights. So what can we understand in terms of the impact on the environment, society and governance? So what we call the ESG approach, sorry. So ESG is all about issuing relating to sustainability, to ethical, behavior and to corporate governance issues such as management of a firm's carbon footprint and ensuring that there are systems in place to ensure accountability. So here what we're talking about is what ESG or environmental, social and governance approaches or policies can a business have in place to ensure accountability. So ESG tends to be considered by investors who will assess the corporate behavior of a firm. What do you mean by that? Well, investors want to look at, well, what's going on in a company? What's important in that company? Why do we need to be aware of what that company is doing? Now, ESG factors are considered when evaluating opportunities, when making decisions, when managing our investments, and when engaging with companies to seek improvements and best practices and disclosure. So here is some examples of what can be done under environment, what can be done under social, and what can be done under governance. So under environmental, you've got, for example, the use of energy and how companies can perhaps, for example, by switching off their lights in the building at the end of the working day, that can save electricity, it can save energy. 
by powering down machinery when it's not being used. That can save energy. But through waste disposal, by making sure that companies are recycling their waste, the biggest um, polluters, unfortunately, tend to be large organisations because they deal with such a large amount of waste. Um, how they dispose of that waste has a large impact on our climate, has a large impact on our world. Pollution, that's linked to what I just said. Natural resource conservation, again, Earth is a beautiful place. I'm sure some of you come from very, very uh, beautiful countries, you know, where, where there's natural beauty, whether it be through waterfalls, mountains, um, you know, beaches. We've got all these different places around the world that have very, very many um, natural um, wonders that are there to be conserved. Well, how can we make sure we conserve them? What can businesses do to make sure that their pollution, to make sure that their waste disposal doesn't harm these natural places? The treatment of animals, that's also important, particularly in some industries. For example, makeup industry. Until relatively recently, a lot of makeup products by a lot of companies were being used on animals to test whether or not there's any side effects. So, you know, if it can be applied to an animal's skin, does it have any... Um, nasty side effects. Well, that's animal cruelty. I mean, why should animals have to suffer so that people can create makeup? So animal treatment is important. Carbon emissions. So again, CO2, how much CO2 does an organization produce? How can it mitigate that? And I guess CO2 emissions are probably something that's reduced over the last 18 months with lockdowns being put in place across the world because of the COVID pandemic. Nobody was flying. Countries had restrictions on entry um, requirements. So CO2 emissions are something that is quite important and something that governments are currently tackling around the globe. Same with social. There's some social issues here. Child labour, human rights. Again, things we've discussed already. And finally, under governance, it's about the structure of an organisation. Do people have a chance to have their voices heard? Can they report issues? Can they um, effectively do their job without being penalised? It's about employee relations. It's about executive compensation schemes. How do your managers get paid? Is it solely based on profit or is it about delivering on objectives such as sustainability, such as ethical business practice, et cetera, et cetera? And for example, issues around cumulative voting or separation of CEO positions so again, things that are important under the governance umbrella. These are just some examples of things you might want to consider when you're looking at ethical behaviour in an organisation as part of your assignment, okay? So part of your assignment, you have to consider what ethics is, why ethics is important, and how businesses... I'll see you my end where you are. Sorry, whoever that is, can you please go into mute? Thank you. We don't need another break, I don't think, so we'll just skip this section. Right, so now we're going to move into the role of stakeholders. So we talked about corporate governance, we talked about why it's important, but corporate governance is only part of the battle. The other half is stakeholders and why stakeholders are also important. So firstly, who are stakeholders? Stakeholders are all of those claimants inside and outside the firm who have a vested interest in the problem and its solution. And that's a quote there from Mason and Mitroff, 1981. So what's important here is stakeholders don't just have to come from inside your organisation. They don't have to be employees or managers or directors or even shareholders. They can be outside of the company. They can be people like the local community. If you have a big factory in the middle of you know, a housing estate, then the local environment, local community will care about what you do and how you do it. Government government cares about what you do. They care about that because A, firstly, they want to collect tax from you. So they want to know how much you're producing, how much profit you're making. And B, secondly, government also have targets. So in the UK, they want to become net zero on carbon emissions by 2050. So in order to achieve that, they need to make sure that companies are not polluting the environment unnecessarily. They're adhering to a target the government has set. So again, these are all things that the government are interested in. Customers, again, your customers care about what's going on in the business. If you're buying products from a company that's proven to be unethical, 
unsustainable. They're not treating their workers right. They're not paying the workers fairly. They're abusing um, human or child labour laws. Then are you going to continue shopping from them? Probably not. So customers care about their stakeholders. They also care about what's going on in the business. So these are examples of outside stakeholders, okay? Another definition, this one's from Freeman, 1984. Freeman describes stakeholders as being any persons or organisations who can be positively or negatively impacted by or cause an impact on the actions of a company. Okay, so they're either impacted by or they themselves have an impact on the company. Okay. A good example of that is 